A very good evening, everyone. I am Meenakshi Tomar, a proud member of Center of Asia Pacific Business Research Economics and Innovation and faculty in the area of marketing and communications at JGBS. I welcome you all to the ninth lecture of the pandemic lecture series hosted by Center of Asia Pacific Business Research Economics and Innovation Center at JTBS. You all will be glad to know that since March 2020, Kibri has already hosted eight lectures where we got the opportunity to hear insights from highly renowned speakers who gave us a basket of takeaways. Today's lecture comes with a very special feature so far. We have two prominent speakers today with us for the ninth lecture. I am glad to announce that today's lecture will be delivered by Ms. Gargi Sen and Ms. Vinita Nalla. Both the speakers are highly motivated researchers associated with Indian Institute of Human Settlements. Ms. Gargi and Ms. Vinita will be talking about disaster governance, risk reduction and recovery. A very warm welcome to Ms. Gargi and Ms. Vinita. I further request the participants to please type in their questions in the chat box provided during the talk. However, we will be taking the questions only during the Q&A round. I request you all to please keep your mic on mute mode. Thank you. And now I request Ms. Gargi and Ms. Vinita to please take over the lecture. Hi, thank you, Minakshi. Am I audible? Hello? Yes, you are. Yeah, thank you. Um, so good evening to one and all, and thank you for the introduction and this opportunity to present our research. Uh, as Minakshi said, we are researchers at IHS, Indian Institute for Human Settlements. Uh, we're a research organization that focuses on studying the urban primarily. And uh, we have several teams and components at IHS, but Gargi and I specifically work in the risk and resilience team under the practice division. So today we'll be talking about some research that we did over the last year uh, and essentially covering the topics of disaster governance and what really entails uh, risk reduction and recovery post disasters. Um, Gargi, next slide. So over the past couple of months, we witnessed two cyclones of, uh, on both coasts. So the East Coast has weathered many storms over the past decades, but for the West Coast, it is a relatively new event, right? Um, cyclones are quite rare over the cooler waters of the Arabian Sea, but they are known to be increasing in frequency since last year. So these events are not new anymore. Next slide. So when Cyclone Amphan and Nisarga made landfall this year, we saw several new news articles on what the government has been doing to prepare and respond to uh, disasters. We saw news of relief teams and rescue ops being deployed, um, massive evacuations being undertaken, center releasing front funds to states that are going to be affected, early warnings being issued, relief packages, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, so what is interesting in all of this is that all the reporting we saw only talk of the state or the government actions in preparations, uh, in preparation and response to disasters. And these preparations also mainly just involved early warnings, evacuation and emergency relief. So is this all that it takes for disaster management then? Um, so then what happens after a disaster? You have prepared for it. You've given out early warnings. You have um, deployed... Um, um, you know, uh, you've deployed army and whatever. But then what happens after a disaster? What happens to the people that you've evacuated? Uh, to the people who've lost their homes? Or what's being done about it? So rarely do news and popular media actually cover these stories. They usually inform on the scale of the cyclone, how many people were affected, how many assets were lost. These also are mostly represented in terms of numbers. X number of people were killed or X number of X value of infrastructure losses were uh, uh, impacted. But what do these numbers really mean? Uh, what, what do these numbers look like on ground? And is this really an adequate representation of disaster impacts? Next slide. Another uh, interesting thing is that while so we do a lot of research in IHS on climate change and disaster management and sort of try to predict what future um, you know, uh, events like this are going to be like. And our research and research by IPCC and across the world also show that um, 
you know the the likelihood of these extreme weather events like for example cyclones more often cyclones are going to be more frequent it's not going to be new or unprecedented anymore for example we have never seen two cyclones hit both coasts within span of two weeks like that was that was completely like it, it's never happened before uh, next slide so in fact research shows that while disasters of all kinds earthquakes floods lightning strikes etc occur in almost every geographical region right like we deal with them but but in fact we deal with them very differently therefore the impacts of disasters differ also in each geography right um asia for example reports the highest number of people affected by disasters and deaths due to disasters the americas though report higher economic losses due to disasters now these stats are actually very telling it means that americas probably need to invest more in building resilient infrastructure or insurances to reduce these losses and asia perhaps needs to have better mechanisms in place to get people out of harm's way but so then one must one must then inquire and research into what do we have in india in this larger asia sphere then what are the mechanisms that we have in india and how are we dealing with disasters what is really disaster management in india next slide so what is disaster management in very basic layman terms the whole objective of disaster management is to reduce the impact of, of the disaster in the long and the short term and the whole process for operational purposes is divided into four stages as you can see in this diagram it's preparation response recovery and risk reduction now these four stages are not in any particular order and also they are not entirely independent of each other for example recovery measures may be conceived during the preparation stage with an overall aim of building resilience in a community for example if you are building a disaster resilient housing or a cold storage facility for the local fishermen in a coastal area then this shall enable them to have proper housing safe housing and also means of livelihood or means of sustenance in the immediate aftermath of a disaster thus avoiding issues like um loss of habitat or food insecurities that are there now just to familiarize uh, you all with the main actors that are there in terms of disaster management in the country the in india the national disaster management authority is the apex body for any disaster management related actions this was constituted as a part of the disaster management act that was enacted in 2005 as per which every state has their own state disaster management authorities and district disaster management authorities the whole institutional framework trickles down to a village level where there are village level disaster management committees as well that enable any action that has to be taken in response or in preparation of a disaster now the state and the disaster management authorities are the ones that are also responsible for building the infrastructure or laying down the measures or building the capacity of the people to prepare in in the event of a disaster next we have the national disaster response force and the state disaster response force these these two entities are more like the foot soldier which are deployed in the event of uh, once there is an early warning information about an impending disaster as we have seen in the case of amphan and uh, nisarga in the last couple of months the the ndrf and the sdrf were instrumental in facilitating the evacuation that happened they were they were deployed in all the strategic areas to ensure that if any rescue operation was to be carried out they were in place for that even when it comes to resuming basic services like power telecommunication or water supply this is these these are the forces that the governments rely upon when it comes and of course then the army comes in but these these the ndrf and the sdrf are your basic uh, elements that cater to it now if we if we map the role of these actors tentatively to the different stages stages of disaster we see that the sdmas and the ddmas have played the pivotal role in terms of preparation in terms of response the ndrf and the sdrf are your key actors now in terms of an overall risk reduction risk reduction is something we'll elaborate on in uh, just a, in just a while the state and the district disaster management authorities and all the the ndrf and the sdrf they more or less come together to ensure that uh, the risk is curbed as much as possible in the event of a disaster now but when we come to the stage of recovery 
based on how the act, the National Disaster Management Act is framed or how the disaster management plans have been laid out in the country, we have not been able to identify one distinct uh, entity or body that has been assigned the responsibility for long-term recovery. Now, like I said, to, to elaborate a little more on why risk reduction and recovery are the areas that we are focusing upon, you have to understand that preparedness for a disaster is built in anticipation of a disaster and which aims at primarily reducing human casualty. Response and reconstruction in the immediate aftermath is carried out with a real sense of urgency to restore any semblance of normalcy in the disaster affected areas. Now recovery on the other hand entails a series of actions in the long term that does not necessarily have a clear aim defined. What do you aim in terms of long-term recovery? Do you want to bring the place back to exactly how it was disaster for the disaster? Or do you want to make it better? Build back better is the most common phrase that is associated when it comes to rehabilitation and recovery. But what we've realized is that it is this whole thing is only translated or realized with respect to physical or tangible components, and that too partially. Now, risk reduction. And if you can see, preparedness is a part of risk reduction. But risk reduction and preparedness are not entirely interchangeable among themselves. Preparedness as a part of risk reduction is crucial. And at this, at this point, how we saw in term, uh, in, during Nisarga and Amphan, because of the preparedness levels of these states, they were able to evacuate the uh, people in the vulnerable and exposed areas and curb the human losses. But in terms of recovery, what do we know? Do we know that whether these people, whether these states have the means to ensure that the disaster affected areas and the disaster affected people will be, uh, will be given the adequate support or have these states previously successfully uh, managed to uh, implement recovery measures in, the effect, in their disaster affected areas? To get a little more context in that, we, we try to uh, look into how recovery is defined or how, how recovery is perceived in the uh, disaster management plans that is there in the state. So one of the, this is a quote from one of the disaster, district disaster management plans, which says that recovery and rehabilitation is the final step. Fair enough. The incident command system shall be deactivated as the rehabilitation phase is over. Thereafter, normal administration shall take up the remaining reconstruction works in the disaster affected areas. These activities shall be performed by the Working Group for Relief and Rehabilitation under the direction of the DDMA. The whole term of normal administration is, is ambiguous, is just absolutely ambiguous. You do not know whether the normal administration refers to your village panchayat PRI, does it refer to your block level administration or district level or state level? Who, who is the person? Yes, the working group is going to plan for it or it is going to be done under the direction of the DDMA, but is the DDMA responsible for it? We do not know. Now, you have, you have to understand that the, this whole stage that, that we have arrived at, where we are actually questioning that whether recovery is actually a viable uh, uh, thing in our country or not, is, is a viable measure in our country or not, it's not, it's not arrived on at this stage on its own. A lot of it has been steered by the way the Disaster Management Act has been framed. The Disaster Management Act, in the very beginning, it states that relief is a moral obligation of the state of government and does not prescribe any rights per se to the disaster affected people. This, when you look at it in, a, in the bigger picture, it does not essentially define in any way as what is best for people who have been affected by the disaster. Can they say what is good for them? Can they say what they need in terms of, uh, to help them recover from a disaster? No, they do not. The whole disaster, and, and that, that, that is the loophole that through which the whole, the whole process of recovery has slipped. The, the whole process of recovery has just slipped through the cracks that, that the Disaster Management Act has framed. Next, the whole Disaster Management Act lays ample, ample emphasis on preparedness. I mean, it talks about building the right kind of infrastructure for preparedness, it, 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 the whole NDRF and SDRF, these, these ancillary forces have been developed for it, everything. But, and rehabilitation of which we've, we've seen uh, how the housing and et cetera has come up, but 
what next? The, 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 the event of a disaster or the immediate aftermath of a disaster does not define the disaster. What defines the impact of a disaster is how people have lived in it or lived in that place after it has happened for years to come. And in that respect, that act does not identify any specific institution which bears the responsibility for ensuring proper long-term recovery of the disaster affected people. Now, why in this respect, why are we focusing on risk reduction? Risk reduction rather than preparedness is, is, is a better way, is, is a better frame to talk about all this. Because risk reduction has the option of integrating with a development plan in, in, in a way, India is the country which is prone to multiple hazards, as we have, uh, we have seen. Like uh, Vinita said, research shows that uh, due to the effect of climate change, this is only going to get worse in the near future. So if we have socioeconomically vulnerable people, if we have fragile ecosystems that are in the path of these impending disasters, then how do you, how, how do you reduce the risk? The way to reduce the risk, the way to look at reducing the risk is to integrate it with the development of the place. The development of the place, when you start talking about the development of the place, or especially of a disaster affected place, it very organically flows into how the recovery or the long term recovery of the place is, has to be thought about. Now, in, in this current day and age, if the development of a place has to be visualized, planned and imagined, it has to be cognizant of not only the uh, existing conditions of the place, but external, uh, impacts, of climate, external uh, impacts of climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. It is only when we think and, and keeping the whole focus of human development at its core, the human, if, if you are rendering the people in the vulnerable and exposed areas, if you are enabling them with adequate coping mechanisms, you're automatically reducing the risk. And in a way, you are enabling their recovery. Our uh, site of study for um, most of these exercises has been Orisha. Now, Orisha, as it is well known, is a multi-hazard prone state. It faces a cyclone almost every passing year. Uh, amongst the most notable ones, there was the 1999 super cyclone, which changed the, which changed, basically changed the story of disaster management in the country. Orissa sort of spearheaded the uh, disaster management uh, rules and acts, uh, disaster management rules and institution, institutional frameworks that we are, that we see today. Then there was the filing in 2013, then funny in 2019, there was Cyclone Gaja and Titli in between. What makes Orissa even more vulnerable is that along its generous coastline are some of the most densely populated areas and some of its most prominent and important urban centers also lie there. And if you can see in the map below, which maps out the most high risk and the medium risk areas uh, with respect to cyclones, almost two thirds of the state falls in the high risk areas, which are prone to wind speeds of more than 150 kilometers per hour. Just to give a very basic idea of the types of losses, on the top right corner, you see the image of uh, the Puri railway station. A railway, uh, a railway station, a very basic and important infrastructure, which will even facilitate how relief work is carried out, which will even determine how the whole economy of that place will be built that is in shambles. So that is one major uh, infrastructure that is disrupted. There are people, there are uh, the huge informal sector that comes with any tourist town that is, uh, that, that is most parts of uh, Orissa, Puri or Sambalpur or these areas. The, the huge informal sector that, that makes these places so lively that are vital to the character of these places, they are severely, severely affected as you can see in the top, uh, in the bottom right corner. Apart from that, there is, there is of course the loss of housing, your house is getting damaged, trees uprooted and uh, telecommunication lines disrupted, which just disrupt your day-to-day -day living. Right. Um, so given all of this, how does one start to conceptualize what recovery is? 
uh, as Gargi touched upon earlier, different people experience disasters very differently. Sometimes within the same community or neighborhood, people are affected differently. So a lot of it has to do with existing vulnerabilities that people might have. Um, for example, if they are already in debt or if they uh, don't have a secure job, if they have many family dependent uh, members, they would be more at risk or they would experience a disaster much differently than say a higher income or a person with a secure job or you know, if a person is living by himself or you know, it, these things um, change and also change the way you uh, are impacted by a disaster. So then how do we start to think of recovery for all individuals? How do you start thinking of it in a more holistic way? So for that, let's, let's try and understand how to, um, uh, from the perspective of one individual. So if you were to assume the ideal trajectory of development of an individual or a household, say Mr. X, um, is the line in the black. In reality, let's say because Mr. X is from a lower income background, his trajectory would be something along the orange line. So it takes a long time for them to like start making an upward trajectory with a lot of state support like, um, you know, PMAY and all the policies and programs. And he is slowly starting to like build his life up and there's upward economic mobility happening. Now, when disaster strikes, this development is halted. So this trajectory then starts to spiral downwards. So essentially, at the end of this presentation, what we want to like give away is also that, yes, there are a lot of losses in disasters, some, most of them tangible, but what disasters do most and what we are most interested in and we are pushing through our research is that disasters impede progress uh, of individuals and households and communities, and you can scale that up, right? And without the right support, they can deteriorate, and that's how you end up with a lot more poverty post disasters. Uh, essentially, disasters impede development. However, with the right support and safety nets, an upward trajectory can be accomplished. Now, it'll be different than the earlier one that Mr. X was doing. Uh, it, it'll be a new normal, of course, but if done right, it should ideally be stronger so that in the future, when another cyclone or another earthquake comes, he's more prepared or his family is more prepared instead of like repeating the whole cycle. So to give just another example, if you were to build, say, a, a region like Puri or, or um, any, any region, for example, is, is, is affected by cyclone and a lot of houses got destroyed and you were to build concrete housing for people who are living in thatch houses so that they are more resilient to cyclones. But if you don't implement them properly, and if the concrete houses you build are not up to the mark, then the cost of repairing those are that an individual has to take up for a concrete house is far more than a thatch house. This is something actually we see so commonly in Odisha, and it's so surprising because the government has, has put up so many housing schemes and built so many concrete houses, but they're never implemented right, and, and they are of like um, not you know, not cyclone standard or multi-hazard resilient standard houses and therefore at the end of each cyclone they're again destroyed. So then a person has to sort of invest far more money in repairing a concrete house than a thatch house. He knows how to build a thatch house. He can do it without any money. Instead, you have given something in the name of development, did not do it right and now the person has to invest a lot more money and our experience in Odisha showed that this has sent people into a debt trap and it's just creating new forms of poverty in Odisha. So all of this, if development not done right, then you're just sending people more, making people more vulnerable than they were before. And it's actually counterproductive. So actually you would be creating new kinds of risks instead of reducing existing ones. Next slide. So let's go back to our discussion on representation. Why is it important to study representation, specifically how the state represents disasters or by state, I mean government, how the government represents disasters and how these representations are impacting overall recovery. So we have already established that the state plays a very central role in disaster management, perhaps the only important role uh, due to the powers vested in the state from the Disaster Management Act. Now, we've also seen that the state represents disasters in numbers and statistics of losses. There is a school of thought that is pioneered by Scott in the late 50s that uh, in order for a government or the state to function effectively, it divides its constituents, both in terms of regions and people into legible components. So this is how we get wards, blocks, etc. Right? So it's more easy to govern these small 
um, you you sort of decentralize it to a level that you can govern it. You you divide it into legible blocks that is easy to govern. Because these representations are easier to comprehend and easier to deal with, a state can respond faster. Say, if we say, if if we were to report saying X number of houses were destroyed, please build X number of houses to replace them. But when you start including questions like how many of these were families with dependent people, how why were they living in poorly constructed houses in the first place? Did they have access to basic services? all of these are interlinked it's like it's like a huge system so if one part of the system is not functioning properly no matter how many houses how many times you build that system will continue to fail because you've not addressed the root cause of the problem that actually made them not respond too well to a to a cyclone so the state because of this leg you know trying to divide its people into legible components has a tendency to deal with things in a silo now because of ease of operation the state also advances this particular representation of reality in policies like it's not just one person in the state saying okay we will do it this way we have actually written down policies plans and all that are advancing that sort of promote this representation of disasters of disaster impacts and we continue to act based on this so if if the state decides that it can work efficiently if it writes down guidelines for evacuation and that is enough for preparation then it will continue to advance this notion and because that it, it's worked before it's easier to uh, do they have prior experience in it and um, so they so they'll just continue to work along the same line but it's it, this has a very significant impact on how we're dealing with disasters and why we continue to fail to respond wholesomely and holistically to disasters and why we continue to have losses both in lives and uh, assets next slide so our research in investigating how state represents disasters and disaster events led us to interview government officials across all levels in state of odisha so with respect to representation we found that uh, visibility played an important role now i'll, I'll quickly explain what i mean by visibility it's a simple enough concept within a state like odisha uh, which is constantly hit by cyclones almost every year in fact preparedness was found to be not consistent and what do i mean by this uh, only districts that have had prior experience in cyclones were prepared even at a department level only say for example the power sector which has been continuously hit only they were prepared now other districts and other other departments are not prepared because they have not technically experienced a landfall or or a cyclone in its to a sense so last year this has very uh, um, negative implications because last year when cyclone funny hit puri in odisha narratives such as unprecedented were used odisha is a state that gets hit by cyclones every year it's it's little bit ridiculous for a district within the state to say that it was actually unprecedented and because the national the disaster management act says that disaster management plans have to be made every district every department every state has to be prepared yet when it hits a district that wasn't hit before it's being described as unprecedented these narratives are also used to justify poor outcomes now this prior experience narrative is problematic as we cannot wait for every state and district to be hit until we start taking protocols and you know actually start getting prepared for disasters by this logic nisarga is unprecedented too but that doesn't mean that states will not be prepared for it right um, or for that matter justify poor outcomes because it was unprecedented now this prior experience is what increases the visibility so if you have experienced it before you are more proactive in the future towards more uh, disasters so you are more visible in the media and government you know eyes so if the more visible you are the more likely you are also to get support from media support from the government the government you, uh, like last year when the cyclone funny hit uh, the government uh, the state government and the central government released far more funds to districts that were uh, impacted earlier than newer districts and they set up uh, cyclone tracking and uh, uh, control rooms in all of the districts that were previously impacted but the fact remains that the cyclone hit puri which was not you know, which which was not which had not experienced the cyclone before so despite all of this effort that the government is putting in it's not consistent and you are again coming up with this thing thing that we were, it it is unprecedented and therefore we were not prepared so th these are some of the things that were uh, coming up from uh, our field and research in odisha uh, next slide now 
uh, like she said, I mean, how how the representation has been framing the narratives of how these disasters are are, are uh, presented or how what impact these disasters have, and obviously, I mean, how 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 the people's needs are are represented to the ultimate authorities who are going to make decisions is is crucial, right? But I think I mean, in India, maybe the whole point of people's voices actually making a difference in how policies or legislatures are made is a, is a separate debate in itself. Now, earlier I mentioned that Orissa actually spearheaded how disaster management has been framed in this country. This is because even before the 2000, uh, Disaster Management Act being enacted in 2005, post the 1999 super cyclone, Orissa was one of the first states to set up a disaster manage, state disaster management authority for itself. It made its own state disaster management plan and built its uh, the whole institutional framework that is there that comes down to the village levels and you know mobilizes communities and first responders. So and in our previous research, we have uh, interacted with people who were at the hem of affairs when Orisha was doing this. When Orisha was building its very first disaster management system in the state at its nascent stage, and when we spoke to those people, uh, their narrative was that what what was there in our mind as we were coming up with disaster management plans when we were coming up with ways to reduce risk was the the trauma or the shock that the people have faced the losses that the people have faced and how how terrible it was and how how deeply it had impacted them and when we look at that when we look at and basically after seeing that they realized how ill prepared they were to face a disaster or a cyclone or any other natural hazard of that severity now, in the light of this, if we look at how Orisha has steadfastly developed its disaster preparedness, it is admirable. I mean, Orisha's disaster preparedness is something which is globally lauded. Its disaster preparedness is some, the infrastructure it has made in, in lieu of that, the systems that it has developed in lieu of that, has even been, been helpful to them in, in the times of handling the COVID crisis. But if the problems or if the issues or challenges of the people who were affected by the super cyclone then and subsequent disasters have been so well acknowledged and reflecting in the disaster management plans as to how to minimize the losses or how to curb human casualty, it automatically brings us to the question, how is, how, why, why is recovery lagging behind? Are the issues of the people, are the challenges of the people in the long term, after a disaster, in a disaster affected area, which is highly prone to being affected by, by a similar disaster in the future, are there plight, are there issues, challenges not visible to the state? Then if it's not, why, why do they not reflect in the tools that the government has in its hand for implementing long term recovery? For now, state, the, the, the districts have the disaster management plans. Those disaster management plans mention recovery in the most fleeting manner possible. Every way recovery is discussed in those plans or any other, I mean, the, the state level policy has very lofty objectives of enabling recovery or integrating, uh, uh, integrating rehabilitation and reconstruction in the most sustainable and climate adaptive manner, but that's there. The district management plans in no way translate those objectives into actions and recovery feature hardly features in those plans. Another thing that we observed when we, uh, when we studied the disaster management plans of the most vulnerable coastal districts that are there in Odessa is, if you look at this diagram, this lays out the timeline that they have, the, the timeline that they have set to phase out the different activities related to disaster. Restoration and recovery is something which is supposed to happen within 45 days of the event of the disaster. And the long-term action is rehabilitation and preparedness. Now, we may argue that their understanding of recovery and rehabilitation is not adequate, but how is it so? Rehabilitation, in its, in its very basic sense, in the interaction, it comes out as, you know, rehabilitate those people. If their houses were broken, give them back those. But is that all? That is not. And the fact that this same thing appears in almost every disaster management plan is, is, is further, you know, reinforces the fact that recovery as an, as an objective is not adequately represented in 
such a highly disaster prone state and that, that is why and orisha is a historically poverty ridden state i mean its vulnerabilities have been uh, it i mean it has been vulnerable from a socio economic perspective for a very long it's a state that has uh, that has sort of created milestones in terms of how natural resources are are extracted etc but and if if in so many ways it has it has known of its challenges how is it not taking them into consideration the disaster management plans only and only focus on zero casualty that is the mantra of the leadership also and which is admirable which is crucial i mean what is if there is no life there is no recovery but if we have come to terms with reducing the loss of lives what do we do with the lives that are left be, that are left behind what do we do what what are their plans about the people who have survived the disaster but only to be pushed into a, a traumatic poverty ridden and challenged life that 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 is not which is not any any authority's responsibility and that is that is where we would like to come in and find out more and that where we are trying to find out more as to how the poor representation and the poor perception of the state is 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 just cutting this short now now like no there is no uh, uh, discrediting preparedness absolutely but that is not the end of the story the end of the story or the beginning of it has to look at recovery and development as in its core um that's all our end um and uh, we are open to questions if there's any uh thank you so much uh, ms gargi and ms vinita for such an insightful uh, talk i am sorry i cannot put my video on because my internet connection over here is a uh, very shaky right now and i am just afraid i should not get disconnected at this point of time uh in fact uh, when you were talking about stages of disaster management uh it was a uh, very uh, important for us also to understand the uh, different stages including preparation response risk reduction and recovery uh to me individually i was also excited to see the role of government here and as an individual citizen what appears is not what what's true uh the importance of role as a state representation where i myself uh, belong to uttarakhand and uttarakhand is an earthquake prone area and we have seen uh, disastrous effects post effects of those in fact to the extent that uh, people still live in that trauma that happened almost 15 years before and they are still recovering as what you rightly mentioned because it was nowhere in the plan uh i request the audience in case if they have any questions too they may please uh, put that on the chat box and we will take them forward yeah hi this is chitres uh, uh i would like to ask one question regarding since you have said that uh, the government is not considering anything in terms of what happens post the disaster if you have a zero casualty figure uh what is there to for other people in terms of uh, rehabilitation opportunities as well as including employment opportunities okay so you have relocated someone and then you are trying to rehabilitate them so there is no plan as such so basically what you are aiming at is something which is an integrated disaster management response which is like pre at the time of disaster and the post disaster rehabilitation what you are talking about uh what are the views of the private sector per se like uh, even if uh, odisha is not a very highly industrialized uh, state there are still few small industries and there are still must be some uh, agro based industries okay and even in the uh, uh, coastal region there are few new industries which are coming up under the special economic zone regulations so do these uh, private sector supply chains have any uh, disaster response uh, a uh, procedure or uh, manuals to follow or how the government actually interacts with them and how the it it is actually integrated with the overall disaster management plan uh yeah um so that's a very interesting question it's also something that uh, we had uh, that's our um, 
something that we are also pursuing to see how disasters actually impact small and medium businesses which is far less studied to be honest because they are revenue generating sources and um impact on that could have a catastrophic impact on our overall economy as well and so yeah that's that's actually a very good question and the answer is that yes most businesses do have a uh, um risk management plan in case of uh, how how do you budget for a risk how how much do you keep set aside and and things like that but that is mostly in my opinion limited to larger industries small and medium businesses almost always suffer in in conditions like this and as we mentioned in the presentation our um, disaster management act is quite limited right like it doesn't it it hardly involves people or what the role of private sector or any other um, sector involvement it just talks about what the government will do so uh, while it says that okay everybody should have a disaster management plan there's nothing to really enforce and make sure that everybody does have a disaster management plan so unfortunately if you are in the private sector it the onus is on you sometimes there will be relief packages that you can apply to but that's all there is like you know to relief like um even in this covid pandemic you would have seen that the small and medium businesses were the most hit and we were most hit because most of us were dependent on them for our basic uh, um, um services and and things like that so yeah it, it's it's something that we are also looking into and and hopefully we'll build a, a chunk of work on it in the future but yeah great great question i just want to add to that uh, so um if you uh, so one of the major uh, some of the major uh, economic activities that is there in orissa is say the aquaculture practice that is there now that is something which has big players as well as small players now your big players are your i mean aquaculture and fisheries your big players are your large um, businesses that have ample infrastructure which yes they, they get affected in the terms of a, in the event of a disaster but their coping mechanism is essentially how financially sound they are and how much of assets they how much of assets they own in, and which they can recover on their own on their own uh, strength but what does get affected are the smaller fishermen or the individual uh, more marginalized groups that that practice the same form of livelihood but are not recognized enough so if you look at it from that way and in terms of supply chain there are very unique livelihoods in orissa that are constantly getting battered in in these in these recurring disasters but find very little very little mention or uh, uh, very little mention in terms of their relief or rehabilitation measures for example keora uh, the, the one from where where you get your attar or say your betel leaves the betel leaves from orissa are famous across the country now these are these are types of livelihoods which are exclusive to one of the most disaster prone uh, district in the state jagat singhpur and these uh, livelihoods they get repeatedly affected in every disaster that happens but that is not the disaster is not their only problem their problem is their pre existing vulnerabilities in terms of absolute lack of government support to these means of livelihood most of these like um, uh, like uh, keora is still manufactured in the age old traditional process there is, there has been no modernization no skill upgradation and the the processing centers are shutting down simply because it is the government has failed to give the adequate importance to such a unique uh, uh, product that the state produces betel leaf man, uh, cultivators their plants are ravaged in the, in in the event in the high wind speeds that come with the cyclone but they they do not have the means to be able to store their um, their produce earlier on because there are there aren't adequate uh, supply uh, cold chains that are there or any means that can actually enable them to ensure that their crop if not that, that, that their crop can be protected in any way once they get an early warning so uh, to answer your question the bigger businesses of course like i said their financial strength is one of their main coping mechanisms but in in the event of a disaster and what is has what has emerged in our study which is constantly uh, impeding the recovery of these people is the fact that the government is not it has to take a more nuanced approach in understanding how livelihoods of these states are getting affected of these people are getting affected it's not just agriculture it's not just small and marginal farmers and larger farmers 
amongst the small and marginal farmers, there are different types of uh, crops that need specific attention to reduce their existing vulnerabilities and make them more resilient to future disasters. And uh, you, uh, in, in the first part of your question, you did mention that the government is not taking enough action in terms of relief rehabilitation. That's not entirely true. And I'm sorry if it came across in our presentation that way. Orisha has some of the finest relief and rehabilitation schemes that are there. But what our debate argument is that it is really remit, limited to relief and rehabilitation. It's a short-term benefit. It's a short-term help that is lended out to the people. It, it is not something which is looking at the, the, the losses they have suffered in the long term. Uh, 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 a cashew plant that has been blown, a tree that has been blown away by the cyclone is probably not going to bear proper fruit for the next seven to 10 years. So a compensation of 30,000 given right after a disaster is not going to sustain them. And that is what needs to be looked at. Gagi, uh, 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 I'm Chitragal Pai, economics in uh, Jindal University, and I have a question. Yes. Uh, so my question is that, you know, uh, I mean, we, we, we are seeing, you know, the impact on uh, the agricultural sector, uh, the, the rural poor, uh, you know, for what happens right after, after disaster. But, you know, the recent past, you know, when Amphan, you know, ripped through West Bengal, we have seen, you know, the plight of urban uh, destruction as well. So, uh, when it comes to you know disaster management or or the plan, uh, so do you think? I mean, because I do not um, know much about it, so I'm just asking you. So, do you do? In, does the government have a different set of plans for coastal and rural regions versus the urban regions? Because you know the kind of destruction and uh, the consequences might be different. That is actually a, a it's a great question and it's very relevant. So, what we have realized come across in our studies is no. To, to answer your questions, there aren't separate plans of for urban areas or this or the rural areas. It's the plan is meant for a district, and the district disaster management plan lays out how any sort of action will be carried out in the event of a disaster across the district. The the focus on the urban and in that sense, the urban areas have turned out to be more uh, vulnerable in a way that they are not they are not. Uh, prepared because they do, they have not faced the same kinds of losses like uh, uh, Puri. Puri is it's one of the most popular uh, tourist towns at least in the eastern coast that in the eastern part of the country. Puri was without electricity for two weeks after uh, Cyclone Fani struck the state. So and because like she said they were not uh, Puri district has not been that severely impacted in previous disasters, but that does not mean that they cannot be prepared. And of course, an, uh, if an, uh, an urban center has much more concentrated development, so obviously the risks are also far more concentrated in an urban center. So it should be dealt separately. At least there should be a plan or a notion of how to deal with an urban center, but that's not how it uh, pans out. Just to add, um, also, if you look at the hierarchy of how these plans are made, there is one national level plan, then each state has a state level plan, then each district has a district level plan, and within that district, you, you can also have department level plans, like revenue department could have a plan, or gram panchayat village level, you could have a plan, so, but that depends on how proactive each you know, administrative block is. The interesting thing about your question is that cities, although are part of districts, have their own plans. So, like, for example, Mumbai has its own plan, like, even though Mumbai district versus Mumbai city, for example, Hyderabad city versus Hyderabad district, like, a city is, because it's, it's, it's a locus of, you know, uh, economic growth and uh, jobs and livelihoods, it, it has so much importance or significance assigned to it that there is also a disaster management cell that is in each of these, um, you know, top, two, three tier uh, cities in the country and they have their own um, plans and they have their own protocols, they have their own forces and all of it. So it, it's very interesting how this whole thing hierarchically uh, pans out and, and then how it all comes together when a disaster actually strikes because then they all have to talk to each other and put up a united front in responding to a, a disaster. So yeah. And that's where actually nobody, like the plans don't feature. That's where finally people are just pouring in. I mean, Orisha as a state, they've sort of internalized how to respond to a disaster and 
they are really methodical and systematic about it but their plans are something uh, their plans still look the way they looked four years back or five years back and and they're not essentially translating what is happening on the ground thanks thanks a lot uh gargi and uh, vinita i have a question here so a uh, very recent day during this corona pandemic delhi and ncr region witnessed almost 11 mini uh, shockers and earthquakes inclusive and we saw many people started talking about emergency kits uh, yeah. i do not know how far practically is it possible for somebody to ensure that they are running away with an emergency kit uh, what is your opinion on this is it a government driven strategy uh, that has been infused into the system or do you think that this has something to do with individual uh, where when we talk about long term recovery can certainly be associated to such individual practices if uh, people can think of especially when uh, they are surrounded by those affected or could be affected area um gaggi can i step in here yeah please ha so um the covid pandemic has actually put in um, a very interesting turn to the way we see disaster management so far our research has all been about how do we perfect or like how do we actually put in good practices so that you know in under normal circumstances we are able to respond to disasters better now with covid it's it's like a whole new ball game because um for example and it it applies to earthquakes also but if if you have an earthquake uh, um, um warning or a cyclone warning you are evacuated and you are taken to cyclone shelters or open grounds in case of earthquakes where you can take shelter until um, the the event passes but now because and they are designed to accommodate as many people as they can hold because they are usually for shorter durations and people can go back or to temporary shelters later that the government will put up or like ngos will put up but now with covid it's it's so much more complex because you have to have so many more because of social distancing you can only hold so many and there is a high chance of it completely like blowing up in your face because you could it could become a hot spot of covid because of so many people accumulating in one place so um and speaking about earthquakes actually n- most cities in north india are quite hazard prone and are in you know um uh, highly vulnerable to earthquakes but unfortunately most of our infrastructure is not prepared for it um there are um you know quite uh, uh, excellent building codes that are available that you are supposed to follow when you are building in these areas but our experience or our research in uh, the northern states that we shows that you, you know 70% of uh, buildings in all of these places actually don't follow these codes are more cramped are more uh, um, sort of um, uh, are highly at risk to earthquake should a large one come and um, so emergency kits and all are also immediate relief but uh um, earthquake is a huge sort of an impending uh, disaster in waiting because uh, we are not um, i mean there has to be a lot more preparation uh, that goes into actually building resilient infrastructure so that you are actually protecting your people and assets when an earthquake does strike thank you that pretty much answers my uh, question can you want to say something no no like that's what that's what is uh, what i was like uh, it essentially has to be integrated with how the development of that particular city is planned i mean an earthquake does not give you as much warning as a cyclone gives you in today's day and today we i mean we are aware of us often often of uh, approaching cyclone almost 7 days in advance but an earthquake does not give you that much of a warning it is not it is not possible to predict an earthquake so far along so far uh, ahead so and i mean uh, an emergency kit is just something which is which can see you through very very immediate aftermath but it is not a solution i mean if if your houses are essentially not designed to uh, bear bear an earthquake or to see through an earthquake or if your basic infrastructure is not resilient enough to face an earthquake then no um, emergency kit is going to be uh, is going to resolve your issues and in fact earthquakes um, 
show a very different side to disasters because when cyclone occur no you can actually go to like large public buildings and take shelter but if you, if those buildings are not earthquake resistant then they are the ones that will crash down mm-hmm. and if your essential services like hospitals are are like you know those buildings are not actually earthquake resistant then like uh, the recovery part of it is is far more challenging it's 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 a very uh, it's a whole other dimension to think about how to be prepared for earthquakes and now that delhi is experiencing a couple of short ones i'm i'm glad that you know this discourse is back in 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 the public sphere because we haven't seen earthquakes since uh the 2001 bhuj like a major one and hopefully we won't in the future but yeah uh, preparedness for earthquake is something that really needs to get back into popular discussions so just to add on to it uh, some zoologists from varia institute of himalayan uh, studies have uh, commented that you know though they do not have any uh, research or any such a uh, previous study that can talk about predictions of any such earthquakes but they definitely remark stating that it could be a uh, indicative of something very big coming up in the future and that's where this emergency kit uh, thing started coming up where people told us to include as much as uh, your important documents some cash jewelry etc etc uh but i'm glad that uh you know it it gave me a clarity on how should we look at a disaster coming up a deep cyclone beat or could at the end of the day long term recovery is what uh we should certainly focus on uh as the government uh their role over here becomes really very important because at the end of the day to drive us even more smoothly post the disaster Uh, becomes their imperative, and so is in the case of COVID. We all are eyeing on what is government having next to announce for us, to announce for the economy, to develop even more, to help people come back from the shock that they have gone into because of loss of businesses, because of loss of so many things. And as what Kargi rightly pointed out uh, while uh, her talk, uh, she remarked that you know uh, it's not just about a house. or it's not just about a career it has so much you know people uh, have to start their lives afresh and they're already under such traumatic situations so instead not only long term recovery but government should also help them with some uh, platforms for mental health discussions which i'm sure is not available at all in their plans that's that's a very good point yeah mental health especially in in covid times is is such an important discussion right now and yeah that hardly features ever it's and it's an even if disaster uh, no it's interesting yeah. point of that out uh, orissa after the 1999 super cyclone when they were working closely with undp they actually did start focusing on mental health because like i said like even the people whom we spoke to who were building the disaster management authority or making their first first very nascent uh, disaster management plans they realized how how traumatized the people were and there was there was a very small initiative that did come up about uh, looking at the mental health of people yes it does take a setback and you know very interesting avenues have emerged from this in it based on this there have been avenues in strengthening women and uh, you know um, enabling more self help groups because what they did observe was that in the immediate aftermath of a disaster the men are far more mentally vulnerable the men they they i mean that's something they we got from the field also that the men they feel dejected and depressed because they are not able to take care of their family or provide for them and that is when the women emerge as the key players who are holding the fort together and that's why uh, there are livelihood schemes which which again did not target at recovery which which were in the states mechanism as a separate thing uh, which were running in parallel but these have actually created smaller forces that are enabling recovery but it, they are not talked about they are not discussed in the discourse of disaster recovery what we are also trying to push is that you know identify what are the strengths that you have that are enabling any sort of help or any sort of recovery in the in 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 at the grassroots level and once you identify those strengths there is a, there is always scope to leverage them further 
Oh, well, that's a very interesting dimension that you've spoken about, uh, Gargi, and uh, we are sure that in the near future, we will look on to uh, different research perspectives could be through our center itself. And we would surely feel proud and honored to invite both of you uh, to work on a joint piece in here because there are very uh, less research articles that even talk about such important issues all that we stop it at is financial assistance and it's done. So we will uh, surely look forward to having a close work uh, with both of you here in this case. Uh, as so we much. come to the- Thank you. Uh, I would first of all like to take this opportunity to thank uh, both Ms. Gargi and Ms. Vinita to take, for taking out the time and delivering such a wonderful discussion. Uh, as we come to the end of this lecture, uh, I would like to invite you both to the 10th lecture under Kibri, which is scheduled on 24th June 2020, which is the coming Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. So we would be very glad to have you as uh, participants uh, there. The center will be hosting Mr. Pramat Malik, who is sales director at Grid Dynamics, San Francisco, USA. He will be speaking on decision making under uncertainty. So I'm certain sure that, you know, both these topics are somewhere or the other very much correlated. I am sure that the kind of insights that we're working out today have something to do with our next uh, lecture. On behalf of JTBS, I would like to thank the speakers and the center for organizing this uh, lecture. Lastly, I thank the participants for being a wonderful audience and bringing some great insights to the table. Thank you all very much. Please stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.